Well, thank you very much for a, such a kind introduction. And thank you very much, Dr. Mahash Manash and the organizing committee of IAP Neocon 2020-2021. And uh, for you, the moderators, Sumar, Dr. Sumar Rao and Srini Ash R. Um, let me try to share with you the, the slides here. Can you see them now? Yes, we can see. Okay. So we can start. Certainly, as you know, pulmonary air leaks are more common um, in the neonatal period than any other time in life. It is increasing for term babies due to the fact that the perivascular connective tissue in preterm babies is less dissectable and more abundant than other uh, infants. And that's the reason to address this um, issue today. I don't have any disclosures to make. Let me get the next slide. And um, only the fact that um, I've been in this uh, business for a long time. And therefore, uh, I have seen a lot of changes uh, that has occurred throughout the history of my neonatology period in many of the areas. And I just collect this list um, <clears throat> that really is not complete, but it just what comes to mind as the main factors that could be related to this issue. One of those one, is uh, basically the equipment and its use. As you may know, uh, we use intermittent mandatory ventilation for a long time and only uh, synchronized intermittent mandatory ventilation uh, came into place later on. And as you can see here, um, because we have intermittent mandatory ventilation, we can synchronize the infants and therefore also infants that were uh, ventilated with that one find the machines and therefore we use higher respiratory rates in order to prevent the fighting of the infants of the ventilator. Nowadays, as I mentioned, the uh, synchronization is the norm in the majority of places. Only ventilation as well, even though it was common in adult medicine for many years, and due to the very low tidal volumes that we have in the very preterm babies, it was only introduced uh, some years after the first decade uh, of this century here. Um, as well, we have the low uh, volume, uh, or low tidal volume ventilation like high frequency oscillator and high frequency um, uh, jet ventilation, which has been used roughly since the 1990s in the many places nowadays. Other important changes that are, I think are important to consider is uh, the fact that the, uh, the way we use the ventilatory support. For example, um, we attempted many changes in the parameters during those years in order to try to find what was best for the babies. Inspiratory time, for example, was used in, uh, up to one second um, as a time. Uh, we used reverse IE ratio um, we have high positive pressures in ventilation try as well as low um, positive and expiratory pressures. The rate, uh, many times we use up to 80 and 90 breaths per minute. All these maneuvers were attempting to maintain the blood gases in what we consider to be quotes, normal, end of quotes, gases, arterial blood gases. And what we were trying to achieve basically was to get parameters that were found in normal babies without any lung disease. So we really were doing a lot of uh, things, trying to attempt, attempt to get something that babies may not be able to give us. Nowadays, we accept lower pHs, a higher PCO2, lower PO2s, and utilize what is so-called now uh, gentle ventilation. So in other words, just looking back to those years, um, what we know now, we were forcing the sickest baby uh, and more fragile infant uh, uh, premature babies to give normal arterial blood gases at the expense of damaging the lungs. Uh, 
Another factor that is uh, really important is the use of prenatal steroids. As you all know, uh, ligands in found serendipitously in sheep uh, that the use of steroids in mothers at high risk for preterm delivery protects their infants from respiratory distress syndrome and death. He therefore conducted a randomized control trial that basically proved this one. And what I have here is basically a cascade of studies from 1972, the one from Ligens that you see on the top here with 1,070 patients, to Eronen in 1993 with 66 patients. And really what you see here is the Ligens study, it is significant favors of treatment as it doesn't cross the zero line, as well as the blocks and Morrison. But the following studies start to share some doubts about this, and there was an uncertainty basically created a, a sense of insecurity when you have these studies uh, read. And therefore, that really delayed the use of prenatal steroids for many years to come. Indeed, the meta-analysis, when you look at this one overall, it is highly significant, decreasing the respiratory distress syndrome. Dr. Jackson Clare uh, uh, from McMaster did this um, sequential meta-analysis. And what you see here is how from the beginning, when you have first and second study and then added the third one and the fourth one and so on, always you see that respiratory distress syndrome is <clears throat> improved with the treatment of prenatal steroids. It is more dramatic the issue of the mortality because you can see here that the mortality was not affected in many of the studies that follow ligands. But once again, the end result is an improvement favoring the treatment. When you do the sequential meta-analysis that uh, Dr. Sinclair was uh, showing here, it, it really always shows that the mortality is improved. That really brings me to a couple of um, factors that I think they are very important to consider. Basically, it has to do with the fact that um, there are two aspects in my mind that are important. One has to do with the researchers and the ethical boards that do approve the studies to be done. They have to be very careful to make sure that there is a the equipos to do the study, otherwise they shouldn't approve them. Although, because that will delay, as you can see here, the a, a treatment that is extremely beneficial for newborn babies. The second issue, of course, is the responsibility that we as a leaders do have in order to interpret it appropriately the results and to evaluate the generability that that might have in our own institutions and in our own patients. Here, what, what we have is um, the incidence of respiratory distress syndrome in Dr. Usher's uh, unit in Montreal, in which you can see that the incidence baseline risk is higher as the gestational age is lower. And as the gestational age grows, of course, the baby, then the risk decreases. And the number needed to treat for um, avoiding one baby to have respiratory distress syndrome in this lower gestational age, it's around four or five uh, treatments for one baby that would benefit. And as the baseline risk increases, then the number to treat obviously increases gradually. Go back to the um, other changes, and let's go to the right side. And we have one is caffeine that well, came broadly into the therapeutic armamentarium. Uh, since the article in the New England Journal by Barbara Schmidt that you probably know very well in 2006. Um, in, in, in this one, she basically showed that there is an improvement in the rate of BPD in babies receiving caffeine versus that they receive placebo. And the difference was around 36% versus 47%. It's more than 10% changes in the uh, BPD incidence in this kind of uh, conditions when you use caffeine in those babies. The other important factor for what uh, that pertains to this talk is the fact that they were able to decrease by one week the ventilatory support in this group of infants. So 
uh, in a study that follows that one that was published in 2007, they show basically as well that the infants um, had an improved rate of survival without neurodevelopmental disability at 18 to 21 months in infants of very low birth weight. So I think caffeine is something that has improved the care of these babies. So factor as well, it was um, introduced many years back, as you probably remember from Jira Lama, that we did the, one of the first studies and successfully really came into their momentarium once again after uh, Dr. Clemens from San Francisco, a study of exosurf and exogenous surfactant in the early 90s. And since then, uh, natural surfactant is the is most commonly used surfactant and has made a huge impact in the care of those uh, infants. In meta-analysis, natural surfactant improved mortality or BPDR mortality and pneumothoraces, and the, the, the changes have been quite dramatic. For example, for pneumothoraces, you decrease basically the rate uh, down to 43%. So the risk ratio is 0.43. Now, the use of postnatal steroids is another factor has been used for many years, as you know, and the use of that one has changed over time because it not only uh, could decrease the BPD incidence and the need for ventilatory support, but as well does produce uh, adverse outcomes, particularly in the motor um, um, area of these infants. And therefore, there they have been changes in the way we used to use uh, postnatal steroids to the way we use them today. There is no doubt as well that better obstetrical care has improved the kind of babies that comes to our units and therefore is easier for us to treat it due to the fact that they are treating better the mothers than they used to. Well, invasive ventilation um, has been really taken off um, in our units due to the fact that in 1987, there was an article published by Mary Ellen Avery well-known neonatologist uh, of a comparison between eight NICU units in North America. And what they found is basically the best outcome was coming from um, Columbia University where Dr. Wong <clears throat> was treating patients with bubble CPAP and uh, triggered the implementation that one of that modality. And later on, the use of uh, less invasive uh, so far used like Insure or Lisa. So what they did, the Columbia group basically was to institute continuous positive airway pressure uh, at about five centimeters of water uh, using nasal prompts soon after birth in all uh, the infants who show signs of respiratory distress with tachypnea and uh, retractions. About half of them in this uh, study were treated with prompts that were applied at the time of birth in the delivery room and the other half two to three hours later. So roughly 57% of the babies never required ventilatory support in this group, which was very different than what they were doing in the other seven units that were compared. They basically use uh, avoid hyperventilation. They allow uh, PCO2 to go up to even 60 torrents per uh, and before they decided to go for endotracheal intubation. They never use or very rarely muscle relaxants, which was at that time the norm in many of the places where we were doing uh, intensive care in these babies. Uh, they were allowed to breathe spontaneously without um, um, excessive ventilatory support to try to use the minimal ventilatory savings that they could. And most infants were in an incubator within an hour. At that time, we used to use warmers, so therefore the babies will have greater uh, water losses. So, and the other thing that is important is that one, only one individual, Dr. Wong, was the one that supervised ventilatory support 24 hours a day. The other issue important to recognize is the team management team management in which now we don't treat the babies by ourselves only, but we have nurses, nurse practitioners, uh, clinical assistants, and we have fellows, and we have uh, psychologists, and uh, 
many other people that really are doing uh, work in which each one of those bring their expertise to get the best treatment in our patients. So one has to look really at the types of outcomes that I'm going to show you, okay, and acknowledging the differences uh, in the knowledge and in the approaches that occurs to those years. It's not that we were um, lesser, uh, smarter, or less knowledge of that one. Is that simply the, the things has evolved as we are learning to use the appropriate equipment for these infants. And I assure you that in the future, we will look back at the time that we are now and how we're doing things. And we will be criticizing as well how we were doing things because we're going to find hopefully better ways to do it. Let me use these slides as a down, as a transition for a bit of physiology, which I think is important to uh, share with you. So total lung compliance is expressed graphically, describes an S shape curve. And as you can see here, the lower graphic shows the uh, surfactant deficiency. As this curve is flatter, we require higher pressure to reach lesser volume, okay? And it's further shifted as well to the right. So depending on the uh, amount of surfactant or in other words, uh, the lung compliance of the lungs, you will have higher or lower a flattening of this curve. The compliance versus the initial level of the lung expansion is important as well. You could be breathing in the A or in the C curve, pressure volume loops, or you could be breathing in B, and that will give you a totally different uh, perspective of how things are in the newborn baby. Because if you were in the A or C loops, you will reach really small volume changes requiring a higher uh, changes in pressure in order to reach this a small amount of volume changes. But if the baby is breathing in B, or all of us are breathing in B, hopefully, then you will really need small pressure changes to reach large volume changes. There's uh, as well the issue of resistance. And in our airways, we could have, and we indeed do have to some degree variable airway resistance. In cases of newborn babies, mucus secretions, for example, or meconium aspiration may lead to unequal distribution of ventilation and different degrees of local inflammation. And that comes with potential uh, complications. As you can see here, if you have an equal distribution of exogenous surfactants, then there will be uh, situations in which, like in A, uh, lack of surfactant will create collapse of the units leading to atelectasis. If on the other hand, you have a normal surfactant uh, delivering this unit B, then that's what will result in optimal inflation. And in the situation that you see in C, is when, for example, you have exogenous surfactant excess, the unit may become overexpanded, and that was predisposing to the early syndrome. So the early syndrome basically It is a condition that is, you can even find it in the literature in many studies that has been done with x-rays many years back, that it could be up to 1% in newborn babies. And I don't think any of those studies have been repeated because it implies doing x-rays in normal babies. But <clears throat> and this uh, description of the pathophysiology has been uh, known since 1944 that was described by McLean McLean. And what we have basically is a broken uh, baseline membranes in which the air wick gets into the uh, bundles of uh, vascular bronchial uh, sheets. And this is going to travel throughout, creating basically either pneumothorax or pneumomediastinum or pneumopericardium. It is important to know that, uh, for example, Dr. Hernandez, she and her co-workers in 1989 um, did some studies that are really worth uh, looking at. And what we can we see here basically 
is how these um, infants, um, uh, actually animals, rabbits, they, they have three different uh, setups, but I'm just going to uh, show you in this protocol two of them. Mm -hmm. One is the closed chest protocol, and the other one is the body cast protocol. In here, have the body uh, cast protocol. But this young rabbit in the closed chest protocol, they simply uh, allow uh, infants, uh, rabbits, young rabbits, uh, in ventilated for an hour at three different peak airway pressures, 15, 30, and 45 centimeters of water. Um, and in the body cast protocol that you see here, they really prepare them before ventilation with a full body plaster cast placed around the chest and abdomen, but allowing it um, to dry completely during normal tidal volume breathing. So the animals then were ventilated for an hour at those same pressures that the other ones were. And obviously, if one uh, were to push a big tidal volume into these animals with a strong chest, it doesn't really hurt the lungs, even when full, uh, positive inspiratory pressure is very high. But if you do the same without the straps, then what you will end up is uh, bursting the lungs, even when the PIP is not very high. So this is what we call volotrauma and low volotrauma. So bolo trauma basically results from the overstretching of histological uh, or tissue elements of the lungs. And it leads, of course, to tearing, disruption, local inflammation, and interfering with function of these elements and structures. Here are some of the effects of bolo trauma. In this case, you have dilation of the terminal bronchial eye in a baby that died of uh, respiratory distress with prolonged mechanical ventilation. There is only overexpanded and coalescing alveoli that are among a majority of totally collapsed or atelectatic alveoli. This is a, a more of the same kind of pictures on the left side. What you have is a baby that is on ventilatory support, but who has proper surfactant. So the, the alveoli and the airways are properly open, all of them, one around the other one. Well, in the other place, if the baby had no surfactant or absent surfactant, then you will end up with the stretching. You will end up, of course, with disruption of the basal membrane. And uh, obviously that will be compressing atelectasis around it. This is two different pictures, totally different one versus the other one. Remember that when we're dealing with very concerned baby, this is a very fragile individual. And this is basically showing how a normal um, developing lungs are in these babies. There is basically a couple of other pictures that uh, courtesy of Professor Luis de Vos. And this slide, I'm just showing you a graphic depiction of contributors to Billy or volume, uh, I'm sorry, ventilatory induced lung injury. Uh, and there has been a tremendous amount of uh, animal experiment showing both the high volume and the low volume ventilation can lead into a lung tissue damage. The mechanism for lung injury may, of course, vary depending on the extent and the duration of the lung uh, overinflation or atelectasis. So what we have is regional overinflation in these babies because some areas will have greater or lower surfactant in case of uh, RDS. And that will lead basically to surfactant inactivation and increased microvascular permeability. Where you see a positive sign of PIP that in implies that the PIP could create greater overinflation and more of these problems. When you have a negative one, implies that this uh, PIP will be uh, decreasing the um, effect in the following pattern, like for example, surfactant inactivation. So that surfactant inactivation indeed is going to increase the fluid filtration, which is going to then lead to pulmonary edema. The increased microvascular permeability will do something like that. And then you will have alveolar floating and reduction in lung distensibility 
the volume. So, which indeed is going uh, to lead to distal lung tissue damage. On the other hand, if we have a low volume ventilation, okay, that is going to be leading to a telectasis, which of course um, is going to create repetitive opening and closing of distal units. And that, um, what it's going to do basically is to lead to a telectasis and it's going to lead to pulmonary edema. And that will increase this effect leading a low volume ventilation. And that it will create basically endothelial disruption, which allow direct contact of polymorphonucleate cells uh, with the basal membrane uh, that will promote therefore leukocyte activation and infiltration and leading therefore to more tissue damage and inflammation, which creates a vicious circle. There is of course a lot of uh, mediators such as uh, inflammatory cytokines, which <clears throat> will be increasing these babies and could start increasing in the lungs from day three, four and so on. And that could be even um, with mechanical ventilation being released into the blood. So here we have a picture of what the end result in these infants will have with a block pulmonary dysplasia and a close-up of the same one showing how altered the structure of these lungs really is. So pulmonary interstitial emphysema high is basically a restrictive lung disorder that is due to extrinsic restriction of alveolar expansion and what you will have is a broken area that will lead to interstitial gas that is under tension. And that is going to increase the airway resistance upstream from the leak, which is here, uh, by partially collapsing the proximal bronchioli. That will decrease, of course, the exploration outflow, and then will lead to air trapping. So what we end up really is with the choke points that could develop um, and usually when there is two conditions that could exist. One is the airway lack structural strength, which is very common in newborn babies. Babies do have immaturity in the airways as well as in the alveoli. And that floppiness of the airways could lead to these choking points. Obviously, babies who have been ventilated for a long time as well will have the same kind of situation. The gas is sucked out of the airways, that usually is the case on high frequency oscillatory ventilation in exhalation, will lead as well to the same kind of problem. So, really, what needs to be done is to have a back pressure, whether by PIP or minimal pressure, creating a pneumatic splint, allowing then, therefore, the gas to enter and exit without any problem so that the um, inadvertent PIP will not occur. Effects of exerting tratoraxic pressure, when you have an um, increase in pressures, then you will have intracranial venous pressure elevated, and then venous return impeded, impeded. And that kind of condition is going to lead to this kind of chest x-ray that you see here. So in which you will have uh, overexpansion of the lungs, or ribs here, flattening of the diaphragm, and pulmonary interstitial emphysema throughout. But perhaps the most important finding here is that you will have a very small cardiac silhouette. So as you know, you need oxygen to be delivered to the tissues. And oxygen delivery to tissues is really a relationship between the cardiac output, which is made of the stroke volume, and the frequency of the heartbeat, as well as the oxygenation in the hemoglobin and in the blood. So you could have a tremendous amount of hemoglobin well saturated with 100% if you like, and trying to get through the brain, for example. But if you don't have a good cardiac output, you will not get that oxygen there. So therefore, it's always really important not only to look at the PAO2 or to look at the oxygen saturation, but you need to look at how perfusion really is in these babies and if you have any alteration there. So let's uh, then move to some clinical cases that I have of early disease. So 
this is not a case that I have um, myself, but and it's a case from 1974, so a few years before I was involved in neonatology. But I have collection of this X-ray. And I'd like to ask you a few questions. This is, um, how did it happen? So was the baby being back with high pressure? Was ventilating this infant with high frequency? Was it a spontaneous leak or none of the above? So if you like to go um, through these ones, that would be great. <clears throat> so in uh, looking at the X-ray, what you have here basically is air around the heart. Then you have, thank you very much for answering it um, question. Uh, you do have basically collapse nodes on both sides, side by side of the cardiac silhouette. And you do have um, gas going into the uh, neck vessels as well. So in reality, this baby was not ventilated. This baby had a perforation of the trachea within the tracheal tube, so you can see side walls, and re really went into the mediastinum, creating all this problem for which this baby did not survive. So um, I would probably would say that this is really an accident. It's none of the above. The pressures, of course, will do that there. But in reality, any pressure would have created that one if you are in the wrong spot. get the slide to move, let me try. Okay, so this is another case that I like uh, uh, um, <clears throat> a bit of uh, information from you. How do you think this infant ended up in this situation? Or was because of high pressure IV? Was the combination of an ill lungs and high pressure ventilation? It was because of excessive surfactant giving? or were no of the above. I wasn't involved in this case either, but it was a case that occurs in the area where I was working um, in one of the peripheral hospitals, not in the hospital I was at that time. And we received basically this kind of um, x-ray from there. And what you have here basically as well is a, a lot of issues here. This baby was born, as I mentioned, in a very hospital, a small town. And during the resuscitation, what they did was they backed the infant. But they backed the infant with a system that was connected directly to the wall, to the gases on the wall, okay, without a proper regulator, leading, of course, to an, an excessive pressure, much higher than this baby or any of us will be able to support with the results that you see in this entry. So the baby basically was receiving a tremendous amount of pressure in, in a short period of time. They stopped it, but it was too late. So what you have here basically is that under the diaphragm, you have gas in the abdomen. Then you have a pneumothoraces. You have gas into the heart. And you can see here the aortic arch and the carotid artery here. So this unfortunate baby, of course, died. The chest tube was placed, of course, without any success. And it was basically due to an accident. So one has to be really careful at knowing the systems and how we do things before we implement them into our patients. This is me in 1987 when I was doing my fellowship and you probably, some of you might be doing it now. And what I have to show you basically is a situation in which I was involved. There was a newborn baby that wasn't ventilated and wasn't doing that good. So the nurses called me to the bedside. I looked at the baby, I was doing an x-ray and I put my apron on as well. They were doing the x-rays. They were doing the x-rays, the baby become white from the head down to the toe. 
And then they brought me the x-ray. At that time, I had already dealt with this, but this is what uh, it was found in this particular case. The next x-ray is the one that I'm gonna show you, in which uh, you can see a couple of test tubes, one on the right, one on the left, but as well, if you look carefully a little needle here that is in the pericardium. This is the following x-ray in which you still see the um, needle in the pericardium, two chest tubes because one of those wasn't working properly, and this one on the right. Finally, the baby did very well and went home after being in the hospital for a few weeks. So <clears throat> the question will be is why this infant ended up with chest tubes? Is because of the presence of initial pneumothoraces? Is because of iatrogenic pneumothoraces? Or is because of the lack of confidence on the part practitioners? I'd like to see what you guys think in this regards. So clearly, this infant had, at the beginning, as you can see here, no pneumothoraces here. And what I was listening when the baby become in a bad shape there, I was listening to the test. I hear very good entrance bilaterally. And I didn't hear that much of a heart sound. The heart sound was muffled. But I didn't believe myself. And the EKG was there. The baby was connected to a monitor. So instead of following what I really thought that happened, I put needles in the, in the upper uh, lobes of the both lungs, creating basically iatrogenic pneumothoraces. And so I would say that the answer for this one, in my opinion, will be um, really uh, iatrogenic pneumothoraces because of lack of confidence in myself. So I encourage you to be confident in what you do because that might make the difference in how you treat a baby in a given period of time, particularly when you have these kind of emergencies where you need to react rather quickly. Well, this is another case in which, as you can see, this baby had a severe pulmonary interstitial emphysema. You have a pneumothoraces on the left side, a very big pneumothoraces of tension, and as you can see, the, the lung is not totally collapsed. And it's not totally collapsed because the newborn baby has a lot of fluid in the lungs and therefore the compliance is not as good as it would be for example in an adult. And you have clearly the um, neck vessels being dissected as well. The other point that is important here in this x-ray is where this UVC line is. You can see it going into the inferior cavern, going into the radiatrium, crosses the foramen oval into the left atrium and find his way in the upper left pulmonary vein. Just later on in my career, in 1991, I was in Winnipeg, Canada. And we usually work for a week as a staff neonatologist. And this is the case that was presented to me. This baby was born in February 25th, 1991. And in March 16 is when I encountered this baby with this X-ray. So this baby basically had a pulmonary interstitial emphysema in localized to the right side with huge blebs there. And basically the baby is not allowing it to ventilate properly. So I review the literature and I look at the possibilities that I can have in order to improve this baby. One of those ones will be to ventilate this baby only on the left side for which you will need to put the, the uh, endotracheal tube on that side, which is harder than to put on to the uh, right side. And there was an article by the Israelis in which they cut the ET tube on the other side of the bleb of the ET tube to bend it towards the uh, other side. And then that way they were able to bring the ventilatory support to only one side. The other possibility will be 
to do under fluoroscopy. Guidance of that endotracheal tube or bronchoscopy. And uh, those to me were a bit aggressive, so I decided to use a swan gas catheter. So what I did basically was to extubate the baby, insert a swan gas catheter, and then reintubate the baby, as you can see here. So that swan gas catheter goes directly into the right bronchi. That was at 15.33 p.m. Then it's been retrieved to the main bronchi. Then the balloon is inflated, and you see here at almost 4 p.m. and two and a half or three hours later, you can see uh, these x-rays in which the lungs, the right lung is collapsed and the left lung is greatly open. So I was working that night there. So I, I relaxed, seeing the results, the baby was doing much better. And early in the morning I was called because the baby was cyanotic. So I asked them to do a stat x-ray and take that catheter out. And what I, I see there is basically this one. So here you see a baby at 35 a.m. next day in which the catheter flipped to the other side, to the left side. And therefore this baby's right lung is collapsed basically. And now we are impairing the ventilation on the left side. That's why the baby was cyanotic. My guess is uh, because <laughs> obviously uh, we didn't know exactly what had happened, is that because of the procedure being um, aggressive as it is, uh, we inflate the balloon for 55 minutes, we deflate it for five minutes in order to allow for the vasovasorum to um, continue irrigating the bronchi to prevent a bronchial pleural fistula. And probably during that maneuver, uh, the nurses immobilize the catheter and then push it back into the wrong place by obviously a, a mistake. So but the baby basically uh, in March was doing fairly well and after bronchopulmonary dysplasia, of course, but went home without any major uh, problems. This is obviously a few years later with a bit more experience in which I have this case. And this case basically is a, a baby, a 560 grams, 24 weeker, who was born in July in, in 26 and 25 or so years later, almost four weeks later, we have this similar situation, a huge bleph on the right side uh, many people used to use chest tubes um, for this kind of babies in order to collapse these blebs. But in reality, that really, I haven't seen it being successful at all. So I inherited this baby in this condition. And I asked the team to do something to make this baby better. And one of the things that I expressed there is that the baby would get worse before it can get better. So look at the date, it's August 20. And in August 21, this is basically the X-rays that you have. I don't see much more changes in this one. And on August 22nd, this is the X-rays that I have. So I've seen some opening here, but not much change here. On August 23rd, this is the X-rays that I have. So you can see much better inflation of this side. And it's still a huge blip here. And I'd like to challenge you to show me where the blood is in this 24th of August action. So one day after the porno book. So I, I certainly don't see it there. And this is the baby in September 11 on uh, ventilatory support. And a few weeks later, the baby was extubated, oxygen was given and went home uh, with PPD, of course several weeks later. So when you're doing this kind of procedures, either way, you could have this kind of problems and you need to really be careful with this in which you will be doing that strenuous procedure and then you'll be fine. But 
these kind of things could happen when we do that. So there is a price to pay when you have a situation like this. So be careful and, uh, about anything that you do in a try to get out of here. Okay, so let me show you roughly what the ventilatory settings in these babies were. As I mentioned to you, on the day, first day of this one, this is the kind of gases that we have. We have acidosis, we have a PO2 that is low, really, 78, but that is in 100% oxygen. And the PCO2 is 54, with this high-frequency jet ventilation, which is supposed to be better for the legs. At, at that time, we used lower peak. That was before the studies shown that we should be using higher peaks. This is the next day gases. And as mentioned to you, I told them the baby will get worse, PO2 38 in 100% oxygen. This PO2 that increases from 54 to 56, but is the drop just a bit. So the baby will get worse before it gets better. But the next day, the pH went up to 768. The PO2 remains low, but improved a bit. And the PCO2 went down to 24. So here you see that the CO2 diffusion is higher than the oxygen diffusion. And the first change that you would see is a drop in the PCO2. Next day, the pH continued to be extremely high. The PCO2 and portfolio continued to be low. We have made changes in the ventilatory support. The mean air pressure was 10 and now it's 7.5. And the FIO2 is 0.39. So the baby is better, but we are chasing this infant because of the changes in the CO2. And even went down farther down to 60 in the PCO2. And the ventilatory settings were um, trying to get that. This is after the baby has been in conventional ventilation. And then you have basically a gases, capillary gases that were fairly good for a baby in a relatively at that point in time, a low ventilatory settings with 40% oxygen. So this baby uh, was extubated a few weeks later and went home later on without periventricular recommendation. We know that hypocardia could lead to neurological damage. particularly when it occurred in the first three days of life, according to Wiswolf's paper in 1996. Another case that I have is this infant that came from a peripheral hospital in level two in Phoenix, Arizona, that was having some meconium. They barred the baby and end up <clears throat> because of the situation in this kind of early disease. So you have here basically uh, pneumopericardium. You see the pericardium here, line here, with a pneumomediastinum and pneumothoraxis that is clearly seen here and here. <clears throat> we end up, I end up putting again a needle in the pericardium and a test tube on the right side. With this one, the baby did not improve that much, so I called a cardiovascular surgeon who inserted a pericardium tube and a pneumomediastinum and mediastinum tubes as well, which I have never seen placed um, because really there is no descriptions in any of the neonatology books of how to place a mediastinum tube. The only one that I know is the first edition of Mary Ellen Avery in neonatology in 
um, 60s, um, in which it was described the four second edition did not have that one known whatsoever. Here we have the baby and with the tubes there. And the baby of as you can see here, is in, in the jet ventilation. Never uh, did ECMO in this infant, fortunately. And after the baby's been off uh, the tubes, and then we have a grateful um, mother uh, with a very normal baby. Fortunately, it was a good outcome. Just remember that you don't need to use very sophisticated tools to diagnose these kind of issues, particularly in pneumothoraces. You could have, if you have a good light and dark room, you will be able to see, like you see here, this baby who has a chest tube here and has some difficulties breathing. So we trust illuminate, and we found out that this baby had a pneumothoraces there despite of the chest tube. And the X-ray basically is depicting the same as the uh, uh, trust illumination is doing. So in summary, important things to consider is when you have a baby who had a problem with lungs and you want to oxygenate and you don't see good response, the tendency is to increase ventilatory support. When you start seeing this kind of situation in which the pulmonary perceived emphysema is present, okay, you shouldn't really go in after chasing that infant because you might end up with this kind of situation, which is the actually that I show you before. And what basically is trying to explain to you through these uh, x-rays is that the, the minimal pressure or skip, you could get an improvement in PEO2, okay, as long as the central venous pressure is normal and the PCO2 is normal. But if you continue on that uh, path, then you may end up with uh, desaturating the infant, decrease the oxygenation, and increasing the central venous pressure with decrement in the cardiac output. So the villi of ventilation induced lung injury, which will end up with a extravular accumulation of air, whether it's a tension pneumothorax, is pulmonary interstitial emphysema, or is a pneumomediastinum or pneumopericardium, will be accompanied by ventilation induced pulmonary edema. And on top of that, if the infant has an inflammatory process like an infection, or any of these conditions, then you end up with the worst lungs in this infant. Um, it is kind of a summary of what I like to say. And obviously, remember that children are not little adults. And I should add that newborn babies are not little children. And therefore, we have to really carefully treat this infant with the more tender care that we can. But thank you very much for listening to me. I hope that there has been triggered some interest on you. And if you have any question, I would be happy to try to answer them. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Carlos, for a really scintillating journey through over decades, through many cases of air leak. Um, it was a wonderful experience and you kept us at the edge of our seats with your many polls and the wonderful x-rays. Uh, we now have a few questions. The questions are all coming in. And uh, I would like to start with the first question, um, which is from Dr. Kavita Shrikumar from Goa Medical College in um, uh, Goa. And her question is, if a baby is already receiving volume guarantee ventilation at four ml per kg, but you still see a pipe picture, can you go down on the volumes and uh, would there be a risk of oxygenation, poor oxygenation and atelectasis and how low can you go down on the volume? Over to you, Professor Carlos. Well, thank you very much. I, I think uh, there are a couple of things that are important here to consider. One is um, how is the baby in general? How is the perfusion in this infant? Okay, do you have any other modalities to treat this infant, like a non-tidal volume ventilation? Is it time to start looking into that one? If you decrease the, the tidal volume too much, then you will end up increasing the, um, the ventilation of the dead space and the effective ventilation becomes lesser. So uh, looking at the baby's condition, 
are looking at how the baby generated this kind of uh, PIE. As I mentioned to you, part of that one might be related to the fact that the baby is air trapping. And if the baby is air trapping because you have choke points, as I mentioned there in the airways, then perhaps you might need to increase the P, positive and expiratory pressure, in order to decrease this issue. So each one of those uh, maneuvers that you will do in the baby will have to be related to all these things. So atelectatic lungs are not going to help the baby at all, right? And therefore, mm, a PIP has to be in a proper uh, level for that particular infant. So that would be one of the things that you need to consider in, in, in this infant. Is the pulmonary transition emphysema localized or it is generalized? And depending on that one, you could do several things that are different. The case that I showed to you, in which I say I, I asked them to do a maneuver, and the maneuver that I asked them to do was very simple. So initially, I started with swan glands, catheters, and all kinds of very invasive procedures that were like that train that I was showing to you going through that loop, creating <laughs> a higher risk to um, damage the baby's lung. So the maneuver was relatively simply, which was simply to place the baby on the right side down 24 hours a day. And that way, you end up ventilating more the lung that was atelectatic, which was the left lung in that particular case, and trying to decrease the volume going into the uh, uh, right lung. So by doing that one, we were able to reverse a situation that was uh, present there. So that would be in a case when you have uh, uh, localized uh, uh, pulmonary uh, emphysema. If you have a generalized pulmonary emphysema, then your approach has to be in regards to how you treat the airways and if there is any ch choke points there. So I wouldn't necessarily go farther than 3.5 at the, at the least of a tidal volume in these kind of babies. And obviously, if you go that way, you would need to really look at how the ventilatory support is. And I would be looking more on the uh, positive and expiratory pressure uh, to see if changes should or could be made in that regards. Uh, thank you, Professor Carlos. The next question is uh, how to manage a pneumopericardium, particularly elaborate on the ventilatory strategies. I'm sorry, particularly on the ventilatory strategies for pneumopericardium. Well, I think pneumopericardium, when you already have it, uh, there is only one treatment, okay? Because you will end up with a tampon aid. And what you really need to do at that point is to be confident in what your diagnosis is, really, and put a needle under the cyphoid uh, appendix, basically, directed to the uh, point, uh, to the apex of the heart, and withdraw from the needle, uh, the air that you have there. Um, here in North America, the people tend to do that under guidance of ultrasound, okay? Because then we do have the machines right there, and it's easier to do. But in, in any kind of situation in which you find yourself in an emergency, like life and death situation, well, you have to take the risk, and you have to put the needle there. Now, it's not gonna do too much harm. The most you will do is go through the heart and get some blood, okay? But if you don't get air, there is usually no pneumopericardium if you put the needle in the right place. In terms of ventilatory support, what we should try to do is try to prevent any of these air leaks to occur. And uh, the way to do it basically is gentle ventilation, proper minimal pressure in this infant, okay? And um, obviously the fact that we have now some fat in our armamentarium it would be very important to try to um, minimize the possibility of end up with these kind of situations. Uh, thank you. Um, we have two questions from Dr. Satyan. One is he's quite enthralled by the swan scans catheter and would like to know a little more about it. And then his question is, uh, short of high frequency jet ventilation, what other form of ventilation is best suited for babies with PI? Over to you. All right, so any kind of ventilation, the best way to treat, in my personal opinion, of course, a baby is to use the ventilatory 
machinery or equipment that we do have and we are used to. Um, if we haven't used, for example, high frequency jet ventilation, high frequency oscillatory ventilation, and the unit and the people that are, are around us uh, treating this infant doesn't know how to use it, I think it's probably riskier to use that kind of approach. So the first thing that I would say is whatever you have better there in your place is what you should use. The second thing is that if I were to use anything, I would try to increase the PIP, for example, and try to prevent the production of the um, air trapping that will lead to greater possibilities of this kind of PID. Uh, high frequency uh, oscillator is good with the only problem though, that if you don't have the proper mineral pressure, okay, because of the exhalatory phase is active one, you may create these short points, okay? But if you have the proper mineral pressure, the risk of that one is lessened. High frequency jet ventilation on the other hand has two advantages. It's a very prolonged expiratory time. We use one to nine, one to 12, one to six, uh, as an aeration in those infants. And therefore, you will be able to allow more time for expiration, uh, passive expiration to occur in those kind of ventilatory settings. So if I were to use it, I would use the yet, okay? I could go to a high frequency oscillatory ventilation with a proper minimal pressure, okay? And if I do have my conventional ventilation, I probably make sure to have a proper PIP in order to maintain um, uh, airways open without uh, um, increasing the chances of air travel there. And in regards to the swan guns, okay, well, I use it in my rabbit experiments to measure pulmonary pressures. The, the, the way we put it basically is put it into the, into the right heart, okay, and go through the pulmonary artery and has a wedge pressure there and measure the pulmonary pressure in those animals, okay? So <clears throat> what I did in this case is look for a device that will be able to uh, collapse the bronchi there. And the Swangans catheter has basically the balloon there that allows you to inflate them, okay? And once again, uh, we I use it several times and one of those times we created a bronchopleural fistula. And a bronchopleural fistula in a newborn baby, premature baby, it's extremely risky. And that's the reason why I was showing to you the evolution of my career, that I was going from more aggressive to less aggressive. And I think the less aggressive you are, the more um, feasible is for the baby to be able to tolerate any changes that we do. If we make changes too quickly in any infants, it's gonna be harder for the infants to really be able to compensate for that uh, less uh, in a new, newborn baby, let alone a premature baby. And my advice will be, think carefully when you're gonna to try to do this kind of procedures. Uh, thank you for your advice. We have uh, two questions from Dr. Layla. The one is about an ELBW baby with chorioamnionitis. We often see a pie picture. So how do we manage this babies with ventilation right at admission? Over to you. A baby with chorioamnionitis? Yes. Okay, so it's the pie picture on X-ray. Well, that's a very difficult one. Uh, obviously, he got pie for a reason, right? So it probably this baby uh, had uh, an inflammatory process going on because of the coronavirus. So you have probably a lot of um, inflammatory mediators there that are going to increase the chances of pulmonary edema, increase the chances of any air leak in this uh, baby. If the baby had um, chorioamnionitis, I would treat the baby as such. So if I think this baby is infected, I should really treat the baby with antibiotics. We usually hear if ampicillin, gentamicin, and I don't know what do you use there, but usually is the majority of people use a combination of antibiotics of that sort. Um, I would try again as much as possible to use gentle ventilation try to prevent the atelectasis by increasing the P. Uh, obviously, surfactant will be, if this is an elderly baby, surfactant to be used in this kind of infants. And sometimes, depending on how the response is, we use it more than once. I don't know 
about you, but the majority of times with one time is sufficient, but sometimes we need to use it two or even up to three times to fatten there. Mm -hmm. The issue of esteroids will be uh, coming into place here as well because you have an inflammatory process going on. And the question is the use of esteroids in somebody that is infected and in somebody who has a, a great deal of inflammation. So on one hand, you will be able to help the baby because of the inflammatory uh, process going on there. But on the other hand, of course, esteroids will decrease the immunity and as well, you will have the problem of cortisol suppression, which can lead to great problems. So I would be careful in using them um, as another part of the moment. Uh, thank you. And we have one more question from Dr. Leila. is about uh, permissive hypercapnia. Uh, when do you start using it? And they usually use it after one week in their unit. So your comment on that. Right. So indeed, I mean, the, the, the curve of uh, CO2 changes over time uh, in regards to how the, the perfusion to the brain goes, okay? So uh, we tend to have uh, levels around high 40s, uh, low 50s early on only, okay? But as time goes by, if the baby um, is older, so the risk of having problems in the brain in terms of uh, uh, intraventricular hemorrhage and so on are lesser, okay? Then we allow that to be built, but gradually. And what we use is uh, around 60, 65 max majority of times uh, in those infants. And obviously, as you mentioned, okay, is something that we'll do it uh, usually after the first week of life. Uh, but that's the point because obviously CO2 either high or low could lead to problems in the brain and we need to be careful about it. Uh, thank you. Um, I now invite Dr. Srinivas for the next set of questions. And from the attendees, please send in your questions. Even if there are too many, Professor Carlos has been kind enough to say he will answer them all on email even after we finish. Thank you very much for that. And I invite more questions from our uh, wonderful participants. Over to you, Dr. Srinivas. Thank you. Professor uh, Carlos, there are some questions uh, one question is from Dr. Uma Maheshwari. Your experience in low frequency, low MAP, high frequency oscillation ventilation for PI. So low frequency, uh, low PI? Low, low MAP. Low MAP. Uh, using high frequency oscillation ventilation in PI. Mm -hmm. Right. So Low mean air pressure depends how low it is, right? Because you could create more atelectasis and create more problems in these kind of babies. So my tendency is to use a mean air pressure would allow good ventilation, okay, without going too far in these cases, because if you use higher mean air pressure, it will end up with greater problems. So these babies need to be um, carefully monitored, in, in not only with blood gases, but without, with perfusion as well as x-rays to see if the heart really is shrinking or not. So uh, that would be one of the issues that need to be addressed. The second thing that they, you need to address in this infant is what else can you do to prevent that to happen? And if that's happening, what can you do to um, decrease the inflammatory process going on there. And it's once again, mm, the other things in the armamentarium would be the use of steroids in this uh, particular case, as well as if you have these kind of situations in which might be related to infection as well, then the use of uh, antibiotics in that case. Obviously that has to be uh, looking case by case uh, basis. Now, I got a, one question from Dr. Rinku Gogai. After putting chest tube, after how much time should we ideally take a repeat chest x-ray to look for changes in the radiological picture? All right, so a couple of things there. Okay, so um, we tend to uh, be very aggressive because we are working in, in intensive care unit. And the tendency that we do have is to do and do and do. And sometimes the less you do, the better for the baby. X-rays are going to be ready in the baby, number one. Number two, you can simply look at how the, the bubbling of the chest tube is going. 
okay? This is still bubbling. You can transilluminate the baby and look, as I mentioned to in one of the slides, how you can use transillumination in somebody that even has a chest tube to really see, okay, do, is it working or is it not working? If you have the proper tools and you have the proper lack of light, that will be much more useful, I think, than an X-ray. Once you have, for example, a, a baby not draining anymore, and uh, the baby, and it's fluctuating, meaning that the, 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 the chest tube is working, and you hear good entrance bilaterally, and you think that you could really um, um, plant that too. You have two choices. One of the choices, and some people use that one, is to plant it too and see how the baby does. And with a tube clamp, do an x ray, make sure that it's not any more pneumothorax before they pull it out. Other people like to do more x rays, like uh, before clamping the tube. Um, <clears throat> that will depend on the, your clinical expertise, number one. And number two, it will depend as well on um, <clears throat> how, how sure you are of the babies not being um, with pneumothorax. But transimulation, in my view, is one of the tools that we underuse and it's so simple and so cheap uh, and it doesn't bring any radiation. It's one of the things that I would suggest to people to use and more often. <clears throat> I think I agree with you 100% because we do use a lot of transillumination in our unit. Oh, that's uh, I got great. A, uh, yeah, I got an anonymous doctor. He has got a question. In some cases, in your slide presentation, we observed that you have, put, you have not put an IC drain for pneumothorax. Please explain. Okay, so um, a needle and a drain rather than a chest tube? Yeah, you're not inserted a chest drain in some cases. In the slides which are shown. Okay, so uh, well, number one, um, in in my presentation, basically, yeah. I was presenting cases that were uh, there that we put chest tubes. Years back, we that's what we did. Okay, we did not uh, treat them um, preventively. We did not treat them by observation, and we even give a uh, hundred percent oxygen, as Victor Chen suggested in in his uh, studies in, in rabbits that will decrease, it would nitrogen wash out the, 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 the pneumothoraces. But <clears throat> nowadays, number one, we don't use the nitrogen wash out because we know oxygen is toxic, okay? Like many other things that we do. Number two, we tend to see how the baby does an absurd baby. As long as the baby is stable, we don't necessarily put chest tubes, okay? And the only thing we do is needle the chest and drain it. And if you are able to drain it without a need to put a chest tube, the better. Okay, so those are the uh, nowadays approaches. Is one is observation. In great number of babies, we do that one only. And uh, the second one is just simply needle the chest, okay, once or twice. And only if you fail, then you end up putting a chest tube. And, and obviously, uh, at the time that I was presenting, which is 10, 20 years ago, the, the approach to that one was very different than it is nowadays, fortunately. Yeah, I got an interesting question here from Dr. Naharmal Soni. I think this was being done previously. What's your opinion on use of high PIP, high PEEP, high tidal volume, high inspiratory time, and a low respiratory rate in case of PI? Well, <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting because all these approaches have been done throughout the years, okay? And I think what we need to do is to look at the pathophysiology and, and, and what is under the underlying process going on in, in our situation. If you have high inspiratory time, okay, in these cases, you might produce hyperinflation, right? These babies usually do have a, a combination of things. So you have areas of the lungs that are telectatic, areas of the lung that are hyperinflated, and hopefully some areas of the lung that are properly uh, um, inflated, okay? And the question then becomes, okay, which areas had one versus another one? My tendency is to use the least um, aggressive way of doing things, try to prevent the atelectatic uh, uh, areas, okay? And try to decrease the hyperinflated areas. Position, in my opinion, 
is better many times, okay, depending on where it is the situation, than um, a ventilatory strategies in itself. So I don't know those strategies myself. That is fine, useful. I've got another anonymous doctor. What are the markers for best PEEP? Do you use for the lung ultrasound? Uh, <clears throat> this is a lung ultrasound is, is recently used really, and we don't uh, use it now for that purposes really. Um, I think the, the, the markers are gonna be the physiological stability of the baby how the perfusion of the baby is. If you can measure central venous pressure, which unfortunately is hard to do and many places don't do it, um, it will be another way to look into that one, okay? If you obviously had an X-ray, then you will see what the heart size is in order to uh, evaluate a, a stroke, cardiac stroke volume. Mm, I think it's mainly clinical markers. I don't think that there is any other ways to try to uh, evaluate that one. Uh, one of the things that happens in, in at least in, in, in North America is that people tend to go and look at the gases and respond to them. And uh, in my personal opinion, as a clinician, we need to be hands-on, be close to the baby, see how the baby's chest is moving, see how the baby is doing, how the saturations are, what the blood pressure is. And those uh, vital parameters are much more important in my personal view than the blood gases. Blood gases can be deceiving. You may have a very good PO2, but if you don't have good perfusion to the tissues, you will not have good oxygenation into the brain, for example. So I think vital signs will be important and be on top of the baby, because as you could see in that baby, despite of the fact that the, I knew those things were happening, the baby was the one that has the low CO2 they was gaining the battle. He was going down, down, down the CO2 despite of whatever we did. Okay, so we were late in responding. And so that's, that's the reality. So being there all the time is the best approach in my opinion. Uh, there's a small addition to the same question on the optimal peak. If a baby has diffuse pi, is there anything different we have to do for the optimal peak or do the same things that you said apply for this baby? I would, I would use something similar, basically. Um, and the other thing that you need to keep in mind is that the compliance of the norm changes. So the optimal PIP today in, in, or, or now may be different in two or three hours in a baby. Or if a baby receives surfactant, the optimal PIP may be different. So you really need to look at when the opening of the, uh, the, the lungs is, the first inflation point is, and it, it varies. It varies depending on the compliance of the baby in a given point in time. It's not the same. The optimal PIP in baby with BPD at what, three, four, five weeks of age, and it is a baby in the first, second, and third day of life, which is extremely changeable. And that's what I'm saying, that you need to really be just there with your patient, looking at the changes that the baby does show you so that you can really um, look um, changes and establish which one is best in a given point in time. Um, thank you. We have some more questions on the management. Uh, from Dr. Shrikan Shanoi, he is uh, thanking you for an excellent session. And he wants to know that if a baby is on positive pressure ventilation and has a small pneumothorax, can we manage it conservatively? I would think so, yes. Um, I think that if you have a pneumothorax and it's located to one place, for example, you could really position the baby to try to minimize the air leak in that particular lung, okay? And, and maximize what you have in the other lung to try to ventilate the baby better from that perspective and wait for the babies to improve. Obviously, you have to be extremely vigilant because if a, a, if a baby is under a ventilatory support, you might make the things worse rather than better. So, but the management with conventional ventilator while you are um, Doing uh, having a small pneumothorax is, is quite feasible, and we have done it several times. Uh, that's great because most of us would rush in with a tube before baby is on the ventilator. Uh, we have yeah. similar question that if a baby has a tube and is being ventilated, do we have to wait to remove the tube till he's extubated? 
No, this I is don't... Dr. Shashidar uh, in Bangalore. Yeah, no, I... Yeah, I don't think so. Indeed, uh, um, when the baby is ventilated, you're giving positive pressure into the lungs, and therefore the uh, negative pressure in, in the pleural space is basically not there. So you can take the two valve with a, a lesser risk, I think, that when the baby is extubated. When the baby is extubated and you take the tube out, if by any chance there you leave it open, the, the hole, then when the baby breathes in, it's going to reaccumulate. So I, I, I tend to do exactly that one. When the baby is ventilated, I usually take it to right there rather than the opposite. That's very, very useful to know, Professor Carlos. We have one more question about pneumomediastinum. Um, how do you treat pneumomediastinum? And I can't understand the rest of it, but they want to know where to put the needle, basically, to withdraw the okay. air. Right. This is the only case. <laughs> that I have been in my 30-some years of practice um, and that I found a pneumomediastinum that needed to be treated. And I'm not sure if this pneumomediastinum itself needed to be treated. What the surgeon did basically in this case was to uh, uh, break the pericardium, okay, and make a combination between the mediastinum and the, and the pericardium uh, sac so that he could drain it everything, okay? Um, as I was mentioning, Mary I mean, Avery in his first uh, edition of uh, Neonatology, uh, uh, it was 1960 something, 62, 63. She uh, had that um, uh, description of how to put a tube into the mediastinum, okay? The next edition that I read as well, okay, did not have that one, none of the subsequent um, uh, editions. And I don't think, and I don't know if any of you have seen any other place where, where that is being described. Uh, probably not because we don't tend to put tubes in the mediastinum. It's very risky, of course, and infection is another of the issues that you would be considering in, as, as a possibility in these babies. So uh, I don't do it. I think uh, uh, media, pneumomediastinum doesn't really indeed causes greater grief in the baby or, or problems. Uh, and definitely pneumopericardium is the one that you must treat because you could end up with tamponade, as well as the pneumothorax is depending on his intention or not by observation, middle or chest tubes. Uh, uh, thank you. And uh, we have some more questions on this. What is your opinion about negative pressure, uh, negative suction for draining a pneumothorax? And uh, if you use it, how much do you recommend? Negative suction for a pneumothorax, yeah. which is not draining well. Yeah. The question becomes why is not draining well? We usually put some uh, negative pressure around 15, 20 at the most uh, centimeters of water. Uh, but the question becomes, okay, is the tube not working well because it's not in a good position, number one. Number two is because it's blocked. There is fibrin or any of the, the uh, blocks or any problems that is not letting do in that one. So uh, we tend to milk the tubes when that kind of situation occurs, trying to really facilitate the drainage, okay, of that one. And I don't tend to go higher than that 20 that I mentioned to you because uh, uh, the, the reality is that we need to really find out why it's not draining. Majority of times it's because it's not in a good position. So either you mobilize the baby so the pneumo goes to the tube, okay, or you mobilize the tube to where the, the air is. And I think that would be probably what people need to think rather than increasing pressures. This is uh, increasing pressure may indeed do the opposite. It may just really make the, the tube to be uh, attached to the tissue of the lungs and not really sucking, but producing the healthy issues. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. And we have a question from Dr. Leela Kamat, um, a, a senior neonatologist from Kerala. Um, as you showed in one of your x-rays, do you routinely put a chest tube in a hyper-inflated uh, pie if the baby is not improving? There's no pneumothorax, only pie. Yeah, no, definitely not. That used to be in the 1980s, 1990s, and people were saying that putting a chest tube will, will deflate the blep. In reality, that doesn't happen. Right? So this baby that I found there is a baby that I inherited with a chest tube. And there that was done with that aim, okay? I think it's a wrong approach because in reality, you are in the wrong space. So if you wanna 
if you really want to 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 deflate that one, either you do it to in the bronchi, collapsing it and not letting the air go in, okay, as in the Swangan's case, okay, which I think is very risky, or you simply try not to ventilate that lung as much, okay, in order to deflate that lung gradually over time and inflate the other one. So no, definitely. This is a, a wrong approach. And that's one of the things I was presenting is how this has evolved over years. It's not the aim is not to tell them do this one, okay? Because that is the wrong approach. Oh, and uh, we have another question from Dr. Nahar Mal. How high PEEP is safe if there is an underlying tracheobronchomalacia? How high the PEEP uh, is, is seen? safe if there is a tracheobronchomalacia? Well, that's the problem with the babies that they usually have bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which is that um, the babies will end up with collapsing airways, very floppy airways. And um, the more you ventilate the babies, the greater the chances to have tracheal bronchomalacia. And uh, depending on what the situation is in the baby, okay, you will go higher in the PIP. What you really want is to avoid the choke points. Okay, so the clinical condition in the baby is the one that should dictate what PEEP are you going to use in a given point in time. Malaysia is one of the conditions in which we tend to use higher PEEP than in other kind of situations. Nowadays, fortunately, we don't have that many babies in that kind of situations because we use non-invasive ventilation mainly in the great majority of babies. And that uh, in itself is, is preventing to a certain extent the production of tracheal bronchomalacia in those infants. But it should be dictated by the clinical condition in the baby. It's hard for me to tell you um, one or another one. I have going up to eight, for example, in some situations. Yeah, over to you, Dr. Srinivas. Thank you. Uh, we have got a few more interesting questions. One, Dr. Naresh Prasad, he has got a question. What is the long-term sequelae of air leak syndrome? Well, definitely it will enhance the possibility to end up with bronchopulmonary dysplasia. So those babies are at much higher risk than any other one to end up with bronchopulmonary dysplasia because of all the, all the mechanistic uh, situation that was mentioned with the increase in inflammatory and mediators and so on. And um, the bronchopulmonary dysplasia will be the one that will be leading the condition in the long run of those infants, of course. So I think there are higher risks than any other to end up with that one. Okay. A question from Dr. Abhijit Singla. Any role of steroids to halt the progress of PI? We clinicians, and I'm talking as a clinician, not as a researcher, of course, uh, we tend to look at uh, this one as an inflammatory process. And therefore, we tend to use steroids in this kind of condition in order to decrease the chance of inflammation in this uh, situation. I think it would be, in my personal opinion, uh, one of the last resource uh, therapies to be used. And certainly I have used it in these kind of babies. And obviously uh, the, the, the effect is twofold. Obviously you might decrease the PIE, but at the same time uh, it's being used for bronchopulmonary dysplasia and trying to decrease the ventilatory support in those infants. So yes, uh, I think there is a role of steroids in that situation. And do you have any preference of steroid? And what is the dose? Is it similar to chronic lung disease? Or? Okay, so we use usually the, um, uh, what is that called? I forgot the name, but it's, it's, um, we use basically the approach of using a, a lower dose uh, over a relatively lower period of time. The, the doses that was mentioned that was used were doses that were used for 42 days. Okay, that was the initial way we started. Then when we recognized in the 1998, I think that there was there were problems with the use of esterols in which uh, in the New England Journal uh, appears a study done in the States in which they use a um, uh, crossover design of using esterols versus non-steroids in the same baby. You could see that the head circumference grow decreases when they were using esterols and increases when this same baby did not receive esterols. So we know that there is effects of a use of esterols that are prolonged. So our tendency is in using it for seven days. And we start with around 0.5, uh, 
kilograms of dex and erason, and we use it for uh, that period of, of time, and we uh, basically stop it um, and decrease it uh, uh, over that period of time by going down by 20% or so every day. And then on the seven days, we'll basically discontinue the steroids. Majority of babies with this kind of approach will be able to be extubated uh, and when we have broken with this patient. I don't know if you do the same yeah. kind of approach there. Also, yeah, definitely we do that. In case of, especially if we think that there is going to be a chronic lung disease, we do use, but the standard dose is as standardized for chronic lung disease. We don't go for the high dose. Um, I got one question from Dr. Vijay Gupta. How to adjust PEEP based on the chest X-ray and blood gas in the newborn with PI? All right, so that's a tough one, of course, <laughs> because um, if you have PI, uh, so you may have the choke points. But if you have flattening of the um, diaphragm, you definitely know that you're in a very high minimal pressure. Then you need to decrease that one because at that particular point in time, your uh, stroke volume may be decreased. And what you really want is to get oxygenation to the tissues. So you need to make sure that your heart is really um, full of blood and is being able to deliver the uh, blood and therefore the oxygen to the tissues. That would be my first step, is make sure that you have a full heart, okay? The second thing is um, looking at the gases, blood gases, and uh, decrease gradually the mineral pressure as tolerated by the baby to a point in which knowing that the uh, stroke volume is good, okay, you still have good blood gases trying to get to the gentler ventilation possible in these infants. The majority of times these babies with pi that are there are gonna remain with pi for a long time. And it's many times hard to get them down, okay, unless we really go to a gentle ventilation, but without going too far to very low uh, tidal volume or very low, uh, yeah, minimal pressure. Yeah, I think recently all of us have started using ventilator graphics. So one of the doctors asked, what is your opinion on the use of ventilator graphics in these cases to prevent pi? I think they are very important. You need to know if your, your, your loops are appropriate or do you have any, any big at the end of the loop indicating that you are overventilating. Um, obviously, um, if you have the right equipment, I think the loops are very useful to tell you if you are ventilating the baby properly. And particularly the important thing is that those graphics are presenting to you how the situation is in a given point in time. So through graphics, you can really change the ventilatory support when needed because the baby's compliance is going to change. No, I agree. I think it's a very good point. Over to you, Dr. Sumandra. Um. I think you must be tired, Professor <laughs> Carlos. We are going on and on. Questions um, are coming. We have a few questions. We could take them by email if you wish. Um, but there's one very interesting question, which I think a lot of us in India do. And that is if there's a spontaneous pneumothorax where a patient is not requiring ventilation, will high oxygen content head box help in resolve that pneumothorax? Is this something that uh, we should practice or continue to practice? All right, so that's a very good question. And as I was mentioning before, uh, Dick Chernick in Winnipeg, okay, did the first studies in rabbits. Uh, and what he did basically was to create pneumothoraces in those uh, rabbits and give 100% oxygen and then do the nitrogen washout. Um, two things. Number one, and I think is the most important part to stress, I wouldn't use it at the present time, okay? I think there's risks that we need to really recognize. But the way we were using it before, okay, was wrong. Because many people give oxygen and leave the baby on oxygen until apparently they know more resolve. And in reality, the way it works is by giving oxygen, you're allowing the extraction of nitrogen from the blood. Okay, as the majority of those babies were in Groomer. When you do that one, then the nitrogen and the pneumothorax goes into the blood because of the differences radiant between the blood and the pneumothoraces. And oxygen will take over that area, right? And what you should need to do is to stop the, the oxygen in the baby 
and then allow the oxygen to be washed out into the blood. And that is the way, because oxygen get greater diffusion than nitrogen, is the way to decrease the, the timing in which the nematodes exist. So and many of us, and many people, I saw the people using 40, 50% oxygen and keep going on. So really, you didn't really do the nitrogen washout as it was described initially. So it was and it not properly used. But nowadays, once again, and I want to re-emphasize that one, we shouldn't be using that one because oxygen is the source of life, but it's as well the source of death. And so um, as we become older and older, we recognize that we have lesser <laughs> antioxidants and we generate apoptosis and then that's really the reality. So oxygen in newborn baby, is something that we need to be using very carefully as a therapeutic measure. I think there was a study in 2014 published in BMC Pediatrics where they compared with oxygen, high oxygen, normal oxygen, and in air. And there was no statistical mm -hmm. difference between those groups. Right, that was, uh, 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 that, that was done here in, in Calgary, actually. Yes. <laughs> it was a very low at the one to reach that one okay, in our babies. But then once again, I think it's properly, probably because the use was inappropriately done. So if you were to use it properly, as was described in, 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 in Victor Cherry's initial paper, you probably would have seen a benefit. But if it's using the way that people use it, it's continued on oxygen, then definitely you will see no differences. I agree with you. So number one, uh, the way we use it is not appropriate. But number two, and more